Coming up this week on the SPNN Forum, we'll be speaking with Council Member Mitra Jalali Nelson of Ward 4. That's this week on the SPNN Forum. Welcome to the SPNN Forum. I'm Catherine Reed Day, the host, and today I'm speaking with Council Member Mitra Jalali Nelson, representing Ward 4 in St. Paul. Welcome, Mitra. Hey, thanks so much for having me here. Absolutely. We're so happy to have you. So, you have just recently won a special election yes. in Ward 4. <laughs> um, just give us a quick update. Why did that even happen? So, yeah, special elections are, yeah. you know, more, they're not always common. Yep, so my predecessor, Council Member Russ Stark, former Council President Russ Stark, um, left his long time on the council. He'd served our community for a decade to join Mayor Carter's administration. He now is our Chief Resilience Officer at the City of St. Paul, um, doing good work and kind of at the heart of what he's passionate about. And so that triggered a special election in um, around this time, actually, last year in 2018. And I decided to run for uh, a term to fill, fill out the remainder of his term. So it's a funny time to be joining the council and a very um, fast paced time, kind of on multiple fronts. One in that I started right away um, after winning my election on August yeah, 14th. Yeah, I mean, there wasn't, but yeah. yeah you sworn had in like on September 5th. So yes, about two entire minutes. And then uh, everyone, the whole council, including myself, are up in 2019. So we knew kind of from the beginning that this would be um, one long run. So I am I'm here in my job now. I'm working hard and I'm excited to tell you more about what we've been up to. Right. Yep. Well, before we go there, I'd love to, uh, I know you live in the ward, mm -hmm. which is sort of obvious, but you live in a, an apartment mm -hmm. um, on University Avenue. Yeah. Uh, but uh, just give us a little quick bio on, you know, where you came from. How did you get here? How sure. You... Sure. So, um, you know, I think I, uh, tried to run a campaign that centered on kind of where our city has been and where we're going. Um, I was born and raised in Minnesota. I'm a lifelong Minnesotan. My mom is from South Korea and she's a Korean adoptee. And then my dad is actually a refugee from Tehran, Iran, and came here in 1979. A lot of Amer Iranian Americans are here because of the revolution that happened at the time that um, displaced you know, my dad and many, many others. So uh, growing up in this multicultural family, being from an immigrant background, being, um, first or second generation, people kind of use those terms interchangeably, but you know, first in my family to really like live a life growing up in, in America, I think a lot of that has formed what my values are and um, how I care about democracy and you know, kind of public engagement. And so for me, my whole background has been about uh, working in public service and also through the government and in organizing to improve people's lives and try to bring more voices into the process. So I started out in my career as a classroom teacher. I taught middle and high school social studies uh, for three years and I saw in that process just what kids and families really go through, not just educationally, but in terms of housing instability, um, their interactions with the criminal justice system, uh, interactions with other social systems that um, are often you know, kind of compounding each other. And that really motivated me to uh, organize other teachers and go into organizing. So in 2012, I joined the St. Paul Federation of Teachers, and I fought for school funding for SPPS. Uh, we just passed another referendum, which is great. But it's amazing, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. It's um, really great. And, you know, I'm an alum of that first campaign. So I worked to organize other teachers uh, across St. Paul Public Schools, and we won. We won $39 million in annual funding. And that was really, I think, my turning point of realizing elections really, really do matter and you can create public power on a large scale to impact people's lives. So that really started the next chapter of my career. And you know, I most recently came off of working for uh, former Congressman, now our Attorney General Keith Ellison. Yeah. Uh, I was his district policy and outreach aide on immigration and refugee issues. And I also worked on outreach to various communities of color. And I think that is also the type of experience that shaped how I hope to be and am working to be an as an elected official is uh, kind of turning the government inside out, bringing the outside in. Um, City Hall comes to the people, it's not the other way around. Just, you know, that constant back and forth and really working to lift up underrepresented voices is a big part of what I care about. So 
that's uh, the arc of my career here. And you know, for me, I chose to run in part because I was um, looking at my story and my trajectory of how I came to be in St. Paul, looking at where our city is going and what we want to be true in our community. And what you see is tons of growth, right, in our city. We are yeah. the fastest growing city in the seven county metro right now. There are thousands of new residents here. And at the same time, if we're not making room for everyone, politically and physically, right, through mm -hmm. you know, growing our, um, just the space we have in a range of ways for people to, to lay down roots here, I think we run the risk of displacement. You know, there's a big challenge and, and that it is an opportunity in our city future. And I ran a campaign to speak to that moment that our city's in. And yeah. so uh, that's how we got to where we are. That's fabulous. Yeah. You know, I think that you, you hit on a, a couple of points. One is that I kind of wanted to find out when you imagined yourself uh, running for office. You yeah. know, when, when it, like, did you wake up some morning and say, I'm gonna be, uh, I'm gonna, you know, run, run for office. But you, you've shared sort of how that happened. I, I, you hit on a really important point that I think has been a major change in the thinking. I've been here for a, a long time, mm -hmm. and and for a long time we weren't growing. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And so when you think about as you've been out, you know, as you were out door knocking before, and now as you're actually listening to your constituents as the as their council member, um, to what extent do they even understand that the city is growing? How much is that something you're having to educate about, and how much do they understand about that? We do we? I shouldn't yeah. say they. Sure, I, you know, I think that um, this theme of change in our city and the need for really engaged leadership is something that is very palpable right now uh, for many in our community. I think the uh, investments we've made to grow the number of homes we have, to bring the light rail, for example, to our city. Uh, we have the stadium that's going up every day now. Um, that Opens has been in since two I months, campaign, right? Yeah. So th those things actually were also part of the underpinning of what was going on when I was running right last year. Is saying, our city's kind of in this critical moment, and we need to have um, leadership for equitable progress, inclusive progress, right, to bring everyone along. Because I think people are seeing that there is change and there's movement, and also we need to, uh, I think, kind of overhaul our systems to to help everyone be included in that progress and that means politically in terms of what kind of leadership we have but I think that also means in terms of the kind of policies we pursue right I mean we need to have a city council focused on equity right now that is thinking about how are we growing so that we can bring everyone with it so I, I do feel like it was this um, palpable sentiment across our community and me running to speak to that and to say uh, I believe there's a huge, tremendous potential in our future. There's a hopeful vision we can work toward, but we're going to need every single person at this table to do it. Um, that is the energy we tried to bring, and I think we're in this moment now where on the governing side, we are trying to lead that change, right? And so yeah, it's a different um, thing, isn't it? To, that's right. To talk about it and figure out how to, yeah. how to make it happen. And that push and pull is the work, right? And so I feel really lucky to be doing it, and I think uh, what I've learned from running is that the people in our city are excited about change and setting a course for the future. And that's what I have always strived to speak to and what I'm really still trying to speak to now, even though it feels like we just, um, we just did all this in 2018, right? We just came <laughs> off of it. But it's, since being in City Hall, it has only affirmed like the vision that I put out, I think, and um, we're working hard to keep making it a reality. Yeah, so I would love, I love that you talk about systemic, and I am also really interested in the um, the way that you are thinking, as I've heard you articulate it recently, um, the idea that it's not going to be done by one aspect of the system, so that it's going to be coalitions, perhaps. Yeah, that may be that's my right. word, but I think it is maybe your word, too, that you used. So I wonder if we might look at a couple of your, I know you got at least four basic platform points that sure. you're working yeah. on so that have been part of your were part of your campaign and we'll just do our best to touch on as many of them as we can today sure. but let's just talk about the housing issue because I think one of the things that I saw you do that I've not seen anyone else do in our community is you rode the rails the other night mm -hmm. you and um, you didn't do it alone yeah and you rode the well rails to look at homelessness in the community housing has been one of your big points we need to increase housing in the community yeah. so um, talk a little bit about the experience. You know, I guess I'd be interested in what made you decide to do it. Yep. Who did you? Why did you decide to go with those particular people? Tell us about that. And what did you learn? And what's the next step? Sure. Well, uh, the genesis of 
choosing to ride the trains is something that really was organic. I mean, I ran in kind of the same time period and moment as now Commissioner Angela Conley, who is a Hennepin County Commissioner. Uh, we ran both on this idea that uh, we have to dramatically take action to address the housing shortage we're seeing across our communities. And the more that I engage in these discussions, the more we see this idea of housing and homes for all, it really is a regional issue. It demands regional strategy and leadership at every level. And then Monica Nielsen is a longtime advocate for people experiencing homelessness who I had been connected to because um, at the same time that Angela and I were running, there were also very visible encampments of people that are experiencing homelessness in both our communities. So the um, encampment at Hiawatha and that, you know, basically making national news over Minneapolis's efforts to support people in that situation. Uh, our city experienced an encampment outside Cathedral Hill. And in the midst of all that, I reached out to Monica because I said, I, I think for me as a new council member bringing new energy to this old problem, what I'd really like to do is start with um, respectful listening and trying to understand the level of decision making that's happening with people experiencing it, right? What can we do to just start by listening and going to people experiencing it and, and just trying to use that as our beginning point to inform what it would take to really take this on. So through that, we um, found this time, all three of us, to go and basically engage in what is the nightly, nightly experience of hundreds of people across our communities, right. which is that uh, the light rail is the biggest de facto shelter in the Twin Cities right now for people experiencing homelessness. And the one we talk the least often about. And we talk least me. often about, and I think there is growing visibility, but I was still very amazed by just when we did that and shared our experiences and kind of documented uh, how many people said it's still so unknown that this is happening. Mm -hmm. And so that is sort of the origins of it. And the whole point was actually to just start with illuminating what is happening in a respectful and humane way, right? But to say this is um, something we can't be complacent about and it also demands a regional strategy, not just one council member, not one commissioner. Right. Um, and I know that work is happening and, you know, Ramsey County is taking steps to take on kind of their part, Metro Transit, their part, the city of St. Paul is working to take on our part, you know. There was the governor's so there's, task yeah. force that worked on it for what, a year? For, yeah, and, and you know, I, the, so it was interesting timing the um, week that I rode the trains, you know, pretty much the weekend we came off the trains, the very next week was just like this barrage of inaugurations. Um, right. Everyone who ran in 2018, uh, again, I ran in the special, so I had my own funny little swearing in that happened in yeah. September, but then everyone else who ran got started top of the year. And I remember thinking to myself, because I was sitting there remembering people's experiences and just playing back moments on the trains, but uh, what I saw was there's a new class of leaders being sworn in that are bringing energy at every level of government to what I hope will be this problem, right, this challenge. And uh, homelessness continues because we are complacent with allowing it to. Right. So how can everyone from the governor to a uh, city council member and beyond, um, you know, work on these things? And Frank, I actually had school board members to reach out to me because yeah. 2,000 kids in St. Paul Public Schools a I year know. are homeless. I was just going to say the principal at Maxwell Elementary was just on the news yep, announcing that, right. that six families went homeless just over the break. That's right. And that was youth and young people are the proportionally highest number of people um, who are experiencing homelessness and are the most likely. And that's also part of what needs to be urgently, you know, yeah. publicly made known. So, 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 the, yeah. so one of the things I want to touch on there is that the, the budget, um, yep. which you helped participate in, yep. uh, which had a very different process than it has in the past. It was mm -hmm. a budget that the mayor's office brought to the people, again, mm -hmm. as you're talking about. Uh, but maybe you could just touch briefly on the the policy that's in what's in that budget that yeah. relates to this platform. Yep. So you know, it, in terms of there's kind of I think two categories, and one is immediate resources for people experiencing homelessness right now, and then one is this longer term um, goal of all the tools we have in the toolkit to take on our housing shortage, right? Because the neighborhood conversations we have over whether or not to to build a new development here or there, or to allow an apartment building, or to zone for more housing diversity, those things are directly connected to people riding the trains. Because what happens is the number one reason people are homeless is not a personal failing. It's not because of struggling with this or that issue, right. which is kind of what I think people assume. It's that there is just nowhere for people to live. There's a shortage of affordable housing at the deepest levels of affordability. And most of what we build does not come close to cutting you know, what folks need at that most marginal level. 
So in the budget, we passed a few things to make investments to get at those needs. And one of them is that Ramsey County has a winter safe space that is 64 beds um, in the roughest time of the year to be experiencing homelessness. So we provided additional funds to help support that as a resource that exists in our city. It's not a city run entity, but it is a thing that serves people in our city. Um, the biggest flagship investment I think we all resoundingly came to accord on was the $10 million affordable housing trust fund that is yeah, uh, going to be a huge source of local subsidy. And that is uh, resources that can do things like rehab old buildings so that they can stay low rent. You know, I mentioned just a bit ago, a lot of new housing we build often just is very expensive. And we have to look at the housing that was built 20 years ago when the best time to build housing was, right? The next best like time Like planting a tree, got it. And we can say uh, some of our old housing stock is some of the best, you know, low rent, um, naturally occurring affordable housing as they call it. And so that can be a source of resource, right? for people to make repairs to those uh, programs so that they can continue to remain low cost, um, sorry, to that housing stock, so that yeah. uh, we can support landlords in applying for um, 4D exemptions and things that help them get um, tax incentives to remain low rent. And it helps us build, you know, we have a whole barrier around accessing uh, affordable home ownership. And when I talk about being a renter, I, it's not just talking about my one place I live right now, it's like my lifelong experience has been renting and I have never owned a home in my life. And that might not be coming anytime soon and that's increasingly true for people in my generation. Absolutely. And so it's about things like down payment assistance, first time home owner support, um, helping people move to ownership. Great. That matters a lot. If you're just joining us, I'm speaking with Mitra Jalali Nelson, who is the Ward 4 Council Rep Representative in St. Paul. So I want to make the connection too to one more of your platforms. With the, we just don't have enough time to cover everything. But <laughs> um, but wealth and work. You know, you ran on a fifteen dollar uh, wage that has now passed. That's yeah. a great thing. Check that off the the box. Yep. But I you know I really hear you taking it to the next level. And you know you are in a district that is the largest, second largest employer in the city of St. Paul, the, the, the territory right here that we're in, you know having this conversation in the Creative Enterprise Zone is is that it's the number one tax base yeah. for the city of St. Paul. Um, and so job creation uh, and spaces for work and all of those things are kind of another layer. So how are you looking at the work and wealth equation? Yeah, so you know this idea of building community wealth, I think um, for me at the time I was running started with passing a minimum wage and then understanding there's a suite of things we need to do beyond that. Uh, I think it's pretty exciting that, you know, at this time last year, I was considering running for office or about to be considering running for office, right? Did not know yet that I would have an opportunity to do that. And we were also at the outset of our minimum wage ordinance process. And I came in and I was sworn in September 5th. And then by October, November, we were in full swing, uh, getting our minimum wage ordinance um, into, real, into reality. And it was, it was very, uh, I guess I was, I was humbled by people saying to me at the end of that process, Mitra, you ran on a position that was so clear and strong on that issue that you being there created a new paradigm that kind of shaped how that ordinance played out and the strength mm. of it because mm -hmm. you were clear and because you didn't waver. And so I think that part of, part of what I have sought to bring is just a new clear progressive energy to the council that's saying, this is our vision for the future of our community. And we can talk about the how of how it's going to happen, but there are some basic what's that need to be addressed, mm -hmm. right? And one of the what's is people should not be working and living in poverty full time. Uh, we have to raise the wage. So beyond passing an historic minimum wage ordinance, there's now a lot of work that needs to be done to continue getting people connected to jobs, resources, and opportunities. Mm -hmm. And you know, it connects back to housing, and I'll just briefly make the connection that half of the households in our city are renting households and then within that um, upwards to maybe close to 60 percent are also in a rent burden household they spend the majority of their mm -hmm. income on rent so we do have to take on housing to help people build wealth right you can't save and invest and do these other things spend your money in the local economy if you're just burning up your paycheck on the cost of living every month yeah beyond that i think we have a very bustling creative economy in ward four we have um 
the, a lot of economic corridors, like down Snelling, um, this idea that the stadium is coming and how to maximize and capture the opportunity that that new investment brings while also you know, coming to the displacement work, anti-displacement work I was talking about before. So there's opportunities to support and nurture our neighborhood businesses and to help connect people to new and different kinds of jobs and opportunities here. I think that is, um, that is what the next year of charting the course as I you know, finish out this first year in office is going to be about is continuing to deepen that work. But, That's fabulous. Yeah. We're not going to be able to get to everything, so I want to just touch on a couple of other things because you have taken, you have been asked to take on a couple of interesting things. So, um, and they kind of connect to this no notion of local democracy that you're talking about, this idea that uh, citizen engagement. So, on the one hand, you're leading the charge around the census. Yeah, that's true. And then on the other hand, you've also agreed to serve on the Port Authority. Yeah. Totally different things. So, sure. <laughs> um, you can pick which order you want to take those in, but I, I think it'd be great if you could just talk briefly about those two sure. things. Sure. Yeah, I'd be thrilled to. So, uh, I guess I can start with the national and go to the local. Okay. Uh, so, the, the census coming up in 2020, and what that means is that we're basically going to be uh, doing a count of every resident that's here now, all the thousands of people who've moved to our city, folks who've been here for a very long time, everyone in between, and we're going to say, uh, this is an accurate count of, of all of St. Paul and Ramsey County, and that is what determines literal billions of dollars of federal investment in our communities. Yeah. So one of, the, one of the fastest ways historically that um, negative forces have pushed people out is by saying you actually don't even exist, right? You uh, aren't visible, so your rights don't matter, your opportunity doesn't matter. And so we're just living in this time, especially at the national level, where we have to stand up and, and say we're going to be counted. Uh, the Supreme there was Court, Supreme Court the just Supreme ruled Court in, just, in that's the favor, right. which there is was, important. Um, there was some, you know, talk of making a citizenship question on the census, which would really break precedent with years and years and years of tradition. It would politicize the census, which has been one of the most just, you know, objective, meant to be a tool for public policy things in our federal government. And we got a ruling in our favor saying, you know, that's not something that's really um, permissible or the way forward on the census. So, you know, in this time where people are nervous to come forward because we have a, you know, inhumane, uh, unspeakable immigration regime, all these things that are happening, I think what the local work is to lead the census is to say, um, we're all here and we deserve investment and we deserve to be visible and for people to know who the fullness of our community is. And so the census work really draws on, I think, my background as an organizer to bring people and networks together to make sure everyone is counted. So I'm co-chairing the effort. I represent the city of St. Paul on the steering committee and then uh, Ramsey County Commissioner Victoria Reinhardt is the other co-chair kind of on behalf of Ramsey County. But uh, we're basically spearheading this effort to make sure that by the end of the census in 2020, uh, everyone has been counted and that we can use that as, you know, the census being something that takes place over, That's is recurring over many years of time that pass. Um, you know, the last, a uh, census that we have shows the median age of our city is 31.5. And that's the type of data that informs public policy making. It, yeah, it illuminates it really, things people don't quite necessarily see all the time about our city. It puts you right squarely so, in the middle of the av average person. Right. I mean, you, you represent, a, <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I mean, I'm guessing, but anyway. Yep, so it's so, about, it's about a more informed public policy making as much as it is about getting federal investment too. I think that's really important, and I think we're gonna we're gonna save the Port Authority for sure. another day because it's just too deep. And I mean, I just want to touch on a couple more things. So one is I wanted you've talked about this inside-out process and the way in which you're making yourself available. Um, let's just talk about how you want to connect. How do you want the your constituents to connect with you, and what do you want them to do? Sure. <laughs> Um, I had so, to think about how I wanted to say that. Yeah, of course. Uh, so, you know, in general, I think that we are working to use every tool at our disposal, in-person meetings, digital, online, everything in between to help people know where they can have their voice heard. But uh, I am always reachable at uh, mitra.nelson at ci.stpaul. We're going to put that up. So, yeah. our, our whole team is reachable at ward4 at ci.stpaul.mn.us. That's my legislative aide, Matt Pravatsky. That's my scheduler and executive assistant, Stacey Cruz. And that, that small and mighty team is serving thousands of constituents every day. So we are constantly taking public comment, helping support people by connecting them to city agencies that you know oversee the thing that they need help with. Uh, we're going to have a series of different kind of public engagement 
um, mini summits or forums in the coming year. So uh, one of the top things that I ran on was just increasing the amount of renter voice at every level of government in our community. That is a very underrepresented group of people despite being the majority in our city now. And so we're gonna work on pulling together some renter engagement assemblies to figure out how we can um, source policy directly from folks at every income level going I'm through. I'm just gonna jump in there that with yep. it, because we wanna to touch on it. It's the 2040 plan, which is in the planning and economic development side of the city has accepted public comments. I know you've received them. Yep. And that's going to be working between now and the end of June. And plans do matter. Things that you put into those plans will show yeah. up. So a pedestrian realm, which is going to be a big yep. emphasis in this neighborhood coming up, is yeah. part of those plans. So, that so that's going to be an engagement, I assume yeah. you want to. I think folks digging into the 2040 comp plan, it's findable on the city website. And the comment period is concluded now. But then we don't actually make final decisions on it until June. So there's a lot of time to really start to you know, look and see what's being proposed and figure out additional ways to shape people's thinking around that. But we need a bold vision that's gonna help us you know, get to the city we need in the next you know, 40, 50 years of our city story. And um, there's just a generation of residents here that are looking to make their way. And so we have to look at how to chart the course for that. So those are some of the top ways, and then we're on, you know, our, our official pages are on Facebook and Twitter too. So you want people to like that page and follow you there because you. That'd be great. The other yeah. day you just posted office hours. You were at Ginkgo Coffee Shop. Yep, doing that's where we. Yeah, and so we post all of the upcoming community office hours as we schedule them, and places where I'd love to hear in person from people. Uh, the last office hours we just did, I think it was nonstop the whole way through, just people oh, coming in, great. kind of grabbing a spot in line and moving people through to get your casework started. Mm -hmm. um, you know get your advice on policy issues, all that's happening. Fantastic. So, yep. And then um, you have also, I know, been at uh, various district council meetings. Yep. You have how many, is it three district councils in your ward? Yeah, so we technically, I believe, have up to five. Uh, we, oh, really? I think we have, our office is working with kind of a, a lion's share of district councils. So <laughs> I represent uh, the heart of Hamlin Midway, St. Anthony Park, Miriam and Union Park, Como, and also like a little slice of Mac Groveland. So uh, there's about right. five I'm different in councils in so there. <laughs> so, so that's a lot of community partners, right? Yeah. And, you know, to the point of continuing to improve engagement at every level, our budget also does include additional funding to support district councils in just better, deeper, more expansive organizing. And we need to tie that to representation goals and figure out the supports to mm -hmm. make sure that accountability is there so that city funds are supporting, you know, engagement that looks like our city. So that's a part of that, um, you know, engagement at every level work that we're trying to do. But uh, I'm excited to continue partnering with all our community councils. I is think it, they do tremendous work every week. So, Is there one comment, somebody who came up to you, this is like the one minute less question. Sure. You know, somebody came up to you and said something that has stuck with you just in the last few weeks. You in know. the last few weeks, uh, you know, I really think someone, a lot of people have come up and said, thanks for what you did on the trains. And this one person said, I've never seen an elected official do anything like that before. And I think for me, what I've tried to do is to do this job differently and to say, if we're actually going to make a dent in some of the most pressing issues in our communities, what we have to do is go right to the people experiencing them and just have a big imagination about what it's going to take to help them. So I feel very humbled by that. Um, I just experienced one slice of what people are going through, but that has really stayed with me. And as I think about what we're trying to do in 2019 uh, to change things and move our city forward, that is at the heart of what we're trying to do. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking the time today, and thank you for watching. Come and see us again next week on the SPNN Forum. Great. Thank you.